So welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, this is a an webinar organized by the Global Advertising Lawyers Alliance. It's on automotive advertising. And we're going to have a particular focus on environmental issues because that's a theme that is common to all of the markets that we're going to be looking at today. And the idea is to give you a general overview of the main risks and lookouts when you're considering running an international automotive advertising campaign. I'm Geraint Lloyd-Taylor. I'm a partner specializing in advertising and marketing in the UK at law firm Lewis Silkin. And I'm going to be moderating the session today. And I'm pleased to be joined by uh, a number of colleagues across the Gala network. There's Eric Ulberg from Wistrand in Sweden, uh, Caroline Bouvier from Bernard Ertz Bejo in France, um, Ignacio Termino from Abril Abogados in Spain, Omolara um, Coyote from O Coyote and Co in Nigeria, covering uh, Africa and the Middle East as well and Mladen Vukmir as well from Vukmir and Associates in Croatia. As I say, the session is being recorded and we're going to make the slides available afterwards. If you have any questions throughout this session, there is a Q&A box um, that you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. And so feel free to make use of that and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. So we've got a lot to get through today. and We've got lots of interesting examples, I think, that we can show you. Um, so I'm going to make a start looking at the regime in the UK, first of all, and asking then the question across all of the panellists, how are automotive ads regulated in your markets? And don't worry, this is going to be a sort of one minute, very top line review across all of these markets. So in the UK, to kick things off, automotive advertising is governed by the same self-regulatory system that applies to all advertising, uh, which is enforced by the ASA, the Advertising Standards Authority. And the rules that apply to automotive advertising can be found in these codes, uh, the BCAP and the CAP code, depending on the media. And they're mostly focused on areas around speed and dangerous driving, um, inconsiderate driving, as well as the usual considerations around misleading consumers. There are some separate rules I should mention for um, CO2 emissions claims and the display of economy and emissions claims. Um, and they're governed uh, by a separate body, which is the Vehicle Certification Authority, VCA. Um, and in the UK, automotive brand ads don't tend to complain about one another's advertising too much um, to the ASA. So complaints ordinarily come from consumers and from road safety interest groups. And in terms of sanctions, the ASA doesn't have the power to levy any fines or bring prosecutions, but what they can do is investigate ads. And if they find that the ad is in breach of the codes, the ad will have to be withdrawn or amended across all media and they generate negative publicity. So that's the way that things tend to work in the UK. So let me hand over now to Eric in Sweden and he'll give us an overview of the situation there. Thank you. Uh, well, in Sweden, uh, automotive advertising is primarily governed by the same rule that applies to all advertising. Uh, the rules that apply to automotive advertising can be found in the Swedish Marketing Practice Act, uh, which are mostly concerned with misleading advertising claims or practices that are not consistent with good marketing practice. Uh, inconsistency with good marketing practice could be issues like uh, marketing in breach of sector-specific laws or regulations, uh, industry standards, uh, general guidelines, or the like, uh, but also IP and data protection laws uh, need to be considered, of course. Uh, the Marketing Practice Act is generally enforced by the consumer agency, uh, but also competitors and groups of consumers may bring uh, actions uh, before the courts. Uh, you can say that in the automotive sector, it is typically the consumer agency that bring the cases that do exist. Uh, we also have a self-regulatory system in Sweden. Uh, the Advert Swedish Advertising Ombudsman is the primary self-regulatory system, and both consumers and competitors may lodge complaints there. Uh, when it comes to sanctions, uh, cases brought under the Marketing Practice Act before the courts may lead to injunctions, subject to conditional fines, damages, and in severe cases, market disruption uh, fees or, or fines. Uh, the Swedish Advertising Ombudsman, on the other hand, does not have any, any economical sanctions uh, in, within its powers, uh, so it cannot levy fines or the like. Uh, but the, uh, the main sanction here is the publicity, uh, bad press, since all decisions are published uh, on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're just muted. 
There we are, you're back. Sorry. Um, well, I said greetings from Croatia. This is literally a picture from the location where I'm speaking from. It's the island of Brač. Um, I wanted to say also that Croatia is an over-regulated country which does not apply its regulations all that often because of the smaller size of its uh, economy. Uh, please, the, uh, you can move the slides, please, uh, further on, uh, Geren. Um, and Croatia uh, has a reason now to think about uh, the future of its regulatory framework. You might have heard about this uh, launch of this car, the Nevera Remax model. Please, next slide. Um, and this is actually the Croatian reality nowadays. You see, this is shot in Croatia and uh, the car is here. So uh, we will need to think about the rules. Next slide, please. Um, the, the one other thing that I will address at the end of the uh, presentation is this um, the fact that there's a lot of companies shooting car ads in Croatia. So there are specific rules tied to that, that's Bentley, Volvo, uh, uh, VW, Audi, Mercedes, BMW, Toyota, et cetera, who are actively shooting uh, on different locations in Croatia. Next slide, please. Um, the, we have a strong uh, uh, legal framework, Act on Impermissible Advertising, Consumer Protection Act, Electronic Media Act. There's a very low level um, uh, self-regulatory just between the companies. So the Honest Practices Board uh, of Hura, the Croatian um, uh, bo board, is 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 uh, also to be taken into account. And the last slide, please, Jeren, in this is uh, there is also criminal uh, penalties for false advertising. This obviously needs to be taken into account. Uh, it's regulated. Uh, by by uh, by this um, uh, by the criminal act, there are few cases, though, as I as I have said initially. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hand over to Lara. Thanks, Jeremy. So, um, hi everyone. It's good to be here. Now, um, there are no direct um, regulations for automobiles um, in Nigeria currently. However, I'm mean, like I've said here. You know, these are the acceptable modes of advertising. And I know for some of you, it will look odd that we still have handbills and flyers. Yes, we do um, in, in uh, various parts of the country and in fact, of the continent. So, so in the advertising standards panel, um, which is the ASP now, it, it, in the advertising code, Article 21, you know, mentions that you must, they must be vetted, except for goodwill messages, obituaries, public service ad advertisements and announcements and vacancies must be presented for vetting before they're um, brought to the public. Um, religious organizations, as you might, you can imagine, um, are quite rampant out in, in, um, in Africa, so they don't need to have vetting before that goes on. Now, the relevant laws I've listed here, um, I'm not going to go through them, but you see that they are advertising regulatory bodies. In addition to that, they're actually um, legislative codes. So you have the code of advertising practices. We have the APCON, you know, they, they do the vetting. Um, they have the vetting guidelines. We have the FCCP, um, which actually um, is invested in advertising as well as the standard organizations of Nigeria. Could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So in addition to these general principles of advertising, which, you know, I think owners of um, products should be aware of, Coming to Nigeria, you you have to. It's it's required that your advertisement in Nigeria should you know any advertisement directed to the Nigerian market, obviously should be legal, decent, honest, truthful, respectful. Um, the models used in the adverts to promote products or services in Nigeria must be Nigerians. You know, except where the concept specifically requires non-Nigerians to act in this capacity. So it's difficult for um, adverts to travel, it will seem, even across the continent. Um, and where the business and objective of, you know, the advert requires non-Nigerians, then a fee um, of half a million naira, which in today's money is about just over, just under a thousand dollars will be paid to the ASP for each content or version. That's something to, to um, note. 
Now, as I said, there are no direct or specific um, adverts for um, automobiles, but these are um, conditions and codes that I think we should bear in mind. Um, the descriptions should be subject to empirical proof and capability. And that's so important, um, especially with, with regard to, I know we'll talk about that later with regard to the um, environmental areas. Now, with regard to sa um, sanctions and enforcement, there is a monitoring unit at APCON. Um, in addition to other services, you know, they monitor the adverts, they provide the monitoring information for purposes of, of compliance. So that's where you would go to, to get, you know, the information you need um, with regard to your adverts. Their sanctions are quite steep and it covers not just the owner of the advert, but also the media house. So a media house that puts on an advert without the certificate of approval is liable to about a thousand dollars. An advertiser who authorizes such is also liable to a fine. So those are things I think we should bear in mind as we go along. In 2019, a direct was released by the ASP, the Advertising Standards Panel, that all communication materials, regardless of the medium, um, must be vetted. So it means that even online um, media, online adverts have to be vetted. I know you may um, be aware that we're having a current issue with a particular social media platform that I will not mention here. So these materials um, that we put online must be vetted in the in internet-based adverts. And I think from the fallout of this particular issue that we're talking, this uh, uh, social media issue, we're gonna have a lot more stringent um, rules and laws to go um, cover adverts. Uh, Middle East. Thanks, Gerard. So in the Middle East, there's a recent study that says apparently um, consumers search for car information on at least three different car related websites. Right. And, um, you know, so 60 to 70 percent, you know, of the consumers spend 10 or more hours online researching their next car purchase. What I didn't mention about Africa is that we have a huge second hand market, a uh, car market. So the used market, there's a lot of cars who come in, which come in from Europe and America. So that is something that we we bear in mind when we should bear in mind as owners of um, or advertising agencies when you're going to advertise um, automobiles. Next slide, please. And the UAE, they have new advertising, advertising standards, which apparently were published in the Gazette and they've streamlined principles. Um, they cover all forms and aspects of our advertisements. Um, and we must bear in mind for Africa and the Middle East, there has to be respect for local, religious, cultural, social values, mm -hmm. which are prevalent in the UAE and indeed in Africa. Um, yes, they strengthen the freedom of um, expression of the media and also the established advert, advertisement sectors um, to which contribute, that they, they recognize that they contribute to the development of um, ec the economy in the UAE. Next slide, please. Thank you. So these are the standards, um, like with everywhere. Something that was quite um, interesting for me to see was must not contain comparative advertising. So they must be clear, um, not co containing correct information, must be lawful, and it talks about intellectual property rights which I think is quite important. And when it's at real life, sorry, back, we go back one, sorry. I realize the specialized fields, obviously with this um, field we're talking about today, proper permission must be sought and aimed. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. And the burden lies on the National Media Council and they penalize um, the defaulters. Unlike in Nigeria where we have various bodies, the National Media Council is, um, Concerned here, and like I said earlier, in Nigeria, penalties may lie against the advertiser, the producer, and the means of publication. So these are things that we must bear in mind as we produce these adverts. Thank you. I think that's it. Thank you. Excellent. We didn't get an overview from France or Spain, but do, do either of you want to um, add anything to that in terms of the general context, or should we move to the next section? Um, I. I... Briefly, we have the same rules and principles as you mentioned for the UK. So the prohibition of depiction of speed and uh, we, uh, the, the framework is regulated by law and self-regulatory system. 
and as it is in the UK, the uh, self-regulatory authorities jury um, do pu um, does publish its decision online, but uh, it is it has no power to 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 find the advertiser. So uh, basically, advertisers do comply with the decision, but uh, from a strict legal standpoint, they are not. Uh, uh, the decision may not be enforced uh, again an advertiser as a court uh, decision uh, would be. And we have the same rules concerning print and CO2 emissions. So I can be brief and, uh, and that's it for France if you want to move forward. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Ignacio, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, yes. Good afternoon to everyone from Madrid. Uh, I just would like to add one uh, particularity of the Spanish legal system regarding the advertising applicable to automotive industries. And this is because we have uh, 17 regional governments in Spain, in addition to the national government, and all the regional governments have competences on consumer protection. So, in fact, we have like 17 uh, regulators and 17 bodies who are watching what we do, and they are quite active. Uh, regarding the advertising of uh, uh, automotive products. So it's something to take into account. Where do you go and what do you do? Where are you? you know, so the, the, the scenario might be very different in Catalonia or in Madrid. Excellent. That's really, really helpful. Thank you for that. We've had one initial question in already. So everybody's keen, which is always great to see. Um, there are very strict rules in France regarding very certain uh, limited things like parking, etc. Um, and I think that's something that Caroline is going to be expanding on a bit later on. So don't worry about that. We will be we'll be covering that in a moment. So let's look at the general topic of environmental issues in this sector. So the main thing through preparing for this talk that we were talking about amongst ourselves was that the common thread seemed to be around the issue of greenwashing and environmental claims. It's very much something that is a hot topic across all markets. So let's have a look first of all at the UK situation. So it's it's a hot topic for the Advertising Standards Authority, which I've already mentioned. It's also a hot topic for another regulator, which is the CMA, the Competition and Markets Authority. Between them, they have come up with these six principles, which are actually quite useful in terms of checking your environmental claims in this sector. So you have to make sure that all claims are truthful and accurate, so nothing too radically new there make sure that they're clear and unambiguous. And that means to make quite specific claims, not very broad claims about generally good for the environment, et cetera. That's probably not going to be okay. You need to limit the claim to some extent. Not to omit or hide important information. So if it's environmentally friendly in one particular way, but in lots of other ways, it's very harmful for the environment, that is not going to be ideal. Um, and that's probably going to be misleading. It links to the other point here, which is you have to take account of the full life cycle of a product. So if it's very harmful to make or you can't recycle it or whatever it might be, it's very harmful, toxic chemicals that it produces at the end. That's all relevant to the full life cycle and the, of the product. You can make comparative claims, but we'll I'll take you through that in a moment. There's, there's some more specific uh, rules around that. And all of your claims have to be substantiated, which effectively means you have to hold proof for it and you as the advertiser are responsible for that before you put out the ad you have to hold that proof i want to look at a couple of examples very very briefly this was one on facebook by bmw in the uk um, it was a, a video created by an individual for bmw so it was a promotional context it wasn't just somebody's own content um, and the person in the video said, having driven petrol guzzling cars before, I realise it's now time to make the switch to an electric car. And with zero emissions, the i3 really is a clean car that helps to give back to the environment. Somebody complained to the ASA about this and the ASA investigated. And the ASA said a couple of things. They did decide to uphold against this ad. So it was found to be misleading. There was a couple of issues. Electric cars and zero emissions. <clears throat> electric cars do not give zero emissions full stop if you look at the full life cycle because they have to be charged and they're usually charged from electricity from the national grid. And in many countries, there'll be a combination of green um, inputs like sort of wind farms, etc. But a lot of it will come from coal fired power stations and various other sources which are not so clean. Um, the other claim that was a problem here. Well, so zero emissions, just to finish that point, you can say zero tailpipe emissions or zero emissions while driving. That's okay. 
uh, but not any further than that. Clean car and helps to give back to the environment. There is no real substantiation about it giving back to the environment. It's actually on balance probably more harmful than walking if you take a car and creating a car with an electric battery is probably quite harmful. So this was upheld for unsurprising reasons. Hot off the press because this was only published yesterday. Um, this was a car, not strictly speaking, a traditional electric car, um, but it was the Nexo. It was a Hyundai Nexo. And the claim was that it was a car so beautifully clean, it purifies the air as it goes. Um, this was actually a car which was powered by a combination, but well, it had fuel cell technology. And so there are lots of great attributes of that. It's not like an electric battery that you have to charge over a number of hours. It's actually powered um, in various different ways by special chemicals. The problem was the claim it purifies the air as it goes. That sounds like a very grand claim anyway, but the way it works is that it sucks in oxygen and purifies the air that goes into the actual motor that powers the vehicle. So it does purify air to some extent. But it's all about the air that goes on inside the vehicle itself, and that includes inside the cabin, but it doesn't have a positive impact on the air around the environment. And the ASA is particularly concerned that the brake dust and other sort of tyre wear, etc., have an overall negative impact. So they upheld this complaint uh, that, it, that it doesn't purify the air as it goes in the sense that a real genuine consumer would understand that claim. Just to mention very, very briefly, emissions claims. There are spe specific rules about emissions claims, as there will be across most European countries. In the UK, this sort of information generally has to be put in printed material, so not so much digital, not TV and other things, unless you're making claims around emissions and fuel consumption in the headline or as part of the ad. And they are now the WLTP figures that need to be used, not the NEDC. That's a transitional thing that's been happening over the last few years. Now all ads have to have WLTP figures. The ASA has produced some really useful guidance in this area on promoting electric cars and hybrids because there are so many different types of hybrids. Uh, they found it necessary to distinguish between them to help consumers and to help advertisers. So anytime you mention hybrid in an ad, you now have to make clear what kind of hybrid it is. So let me hand over to Eric again. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, well, uh, and environmental claims and, and claims about sustainability uh, is always a hot topic in, in Sweden. Uh, and misleading claims in, in this area are pretty fiercely enforced by the regulator. Uh, that was even before our famous climate uh, activist Greta Thunberg entered the scene a few years back, actually. Uh, so is there even such a thing as uh, environmentally friendly cars? And we're talking here, of course, from purely from a marketing law perspective. Uh, and that question has been tried uh, and is answered by Swedish case law. Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, there is such a thing, uh, but it will depend on whether you can substantiate your claims or not. Uh, in this case, it appears to be pretty much the same situation as in um, as in the UK. Uh, and but case law also shows that it's virtually impossible to prove claims that are not very clear uh, and specific about the environmental benefit that you claim. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, and the difficulty with substantiated, uh, substantiating environmental claims can be illustrated by a complaint to the advertising ombudsman where uh, the car manufacturer had brought, bought a full page ad dedicated to the climate crisis. The ad consisted of uh, an image uh, on a white sign uh, with the text world's best car brand for the climate in handwritten letters. Uh, and in significantly smaller letters, the sign also stated, according to the Dow Jones Sustainability Index 2020, uh, in which the car manufacturer had been actually named the best car brand for the climate. Uh, you may find the, the sign that was used in the ad uh, somewhat familiar because it's very similar, uh, similar to the sign uh, with the text school strike for the climate that Greta Thunberg has used uh, during her Friday strikes for the climate uh, over the uh, the past years, but that that was not a particular issue in this case. But 
the advertising okay. was reported to the advertising ombudsman uh, by Greenpeace and, and nine private individuals for misleading advertising. Uh, it was claimed to be a greenwashing. Uh, according to the uh, advertising uh, ombudsman, uh, reference to the Dow Jones Sustainability Index did not constitute a, a specification of the claim, uh, since the the average consumer uh, does not have any knowledge uh, about the details of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, such as which car manufacturers that were actually included uh, in the index, and even if they, to some extent, could be uh, familiar with the index as such. Uh, and given that the ad was not considered to specify the claims that was made in relation to the Dow Jones index, the car manufacturer had to prove that it was in fact better than virtually all other car brands in the world, which is of course very, very difficult. Uh, and it follows from, from this decision that uh, even though the, the car manufacturer, uh, at least as far as I can tell from the decision, they put up a pretty good defense. Uh, use solid facts and arguments uh, with reference and, and documentation that uh, to some extent at least supported the facts and arguments that they made, uh, they were still not able to substantiate the claim, uh, which obviously means that you have to be very, very specific and clear uh, about your claims, even in the ad, and even if you have the good documentation. Thank you. Okay, so in France, um, the most important rules are set forth by the um, SRO's code on tidal sustainable development. This code has been amended last year and now provides that it um, governs all ads, irrespective of whether the ad contains uh, environmental claims. So advertisers must ensure that their ads do not violate um, this code. For instance, ads must not depict overall consumption or waste of energy. And when the, the ad contains um, environmental claims, the message must be true, honest, clear and fair, as you mentioned for the UK, Gert. And of course, the advertiser must be able to substantiate the claims. And the ad uh, must not um, discredit the principles and objectives, as well as advice or solutions commonly accepted pertaining to sustainable development. Um, the ad, of course, must not suggest a total lack of negative impact if it's not true. So we have a, again the same approach and adding in the UK. And of course, general statements such as green, ecological, or preserve environment. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and um, preserve environments uh, must not be used if it's not true. And uh, another other wordings such as help help preserving environments uh, should uh, should be preferred. So I wanted to share with you two examples. Um, thank you, Jared, of ads uh, which have been deemed not compliant by the French um, SROs jury. So on this one, um, environmental claims were featured on a Renault van, and the jury found that the claim zero emissions is excessive and misleading, and that the ad unduly suggests a total lack of negative impact on the environment, whereas uh, the manufacturing process and the whole life cycle of the car generate pollution. So, uh, as you mentioned for the UK, <laughs> the advertiser should have mentioned zero emissions while driving, and it's it's, uh, it's okay if uh, that, um, that is, is very specific uh, on, on this uh, on, on that. So we have uh, definitely the same approach ad in the UK, and the second ad um, was a direct conveys. Con so next slide, please, Terent. Sorry, thank you. So the second ad was a direct convincing email. Um, the subject matter was um, buy bike. It would be good, but we have something which is better. And what, when opening the email, the recipients uh, were presented uh, an ad for an electric car uh, from the French manufacturer Renault, so the Zoe. And um, it was um, written, Zoe, would you take me to the office? 
So the ad does not compare per se bytes to electric cars, but the message instills the idea that the promoted electric car um, is less polluting than a bike, or at least that the electric car um, is not more polluting uh, than the bike. So this claim is not true because for the same journey, it is commonly admitted that um, the environmental impact of the bike is much lower than uh, the one of an electric car. So be careful. And these examples show that the SRO's jury has jurisdiction to review any ad, irrespective of the media, as you know, uh, email or and uh, any any ad, um, if um, as long as it targets the French market, so online ads or ads broadcast through social media network must be compliant. So that's uh, what I wanted to share for friends. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Grant. Well, the the topic of the environmental claims is uh, still very hot in Spain, but uh, already 12 years ago, we we uh, were having this code, as in France, which was the initiative of the energy and automobile industries. Nowadays, it's the only code that we have because we there is no official regulation. And we are applying this code also to other industries because it is becoming more and more uh, usual that all the kind of ind industries are using the green washing or the green uh, claims. And uh, most of the disputes are solved and decided by the self-regulatory authority, which is auto control. Most of the car uh, and automotive operators are members of the association and they, all of them, are accepting the decisions. Uh, more than this, the government is supporting this way of, of uh, solving claims, but uh, we are uh, looking forward to an official regulation uh, that they are talking about that maybe next year we will have something more than a simple code and uh, more applicable than to energy and mobile industries. Uh, I will show you some examples of the application of this code. Uh, for example, this was uh, five, four, five years ago. Volvo uh, was making this uh, advertising, in trying to send the message that you can drive anywhere with your your new SUV, uh, which is a very typical car uh, nowadays in Spain, all over Europe, I suppose. And uh, yes, trying to tell you that you can go even in front of the sea. Well, this was considered by the self-regulatory authority as a way to invite into damaging the nature. Uh, it's quite well, subject to opinion, of course, but if you, first of all, it's forbidden to drive so close to the sea because uh, all coast and offshore areas in Spain are forbidden for cars, are public spaces, and you cannot drive there. So first of all, you are inviting to uh, the violation of a rule, but secondly, it could be an invitation to, to cause a damage to the to the nature. So the Volvo uh, move next year to, to <laughs> the next slide to similar message, but this time the car is on the road. As you can see, they are trying to send the same message, but this time they are aware about how to avoid uh, this um, the kind of decision or interpretation of the code. Okay. A uh, similar case was applicable to Harley Davidson, uh, like saying, um, burn your adrenaline and not your money. Uh, one particular was bringing this case uh, to the self regulatory authority uh, because, in his opinion, it was inviting to a very dangerous driving and also to create the danger into the public area where you're driving. Uh, well, this is subject to interpretation again, and in this case, the, the auto control, the self regulatory, reject the complaint. But on the next one, please, uh, the complaint was accepted. This was uh, one of the, of the first cases that uh, Honda had uh, when the code was uh, passed, because they were saying that the motor was, the engine was ecological, just because a part of it was uh, electrical, but not a full of it. So this was considered misleading because it was not full uh, uh, electric and was not full ecological as well. So uh, they are now taking much care about these kind of claims in, in Spain. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, well, in Croatia, again, uh, there's not much uh, cases uh, to present, so I took a different rule. Obviously, as an EU country, the basic uh, tenets of the regulate, regulatory approach will be the same, like in Sweden, France, or, or, uh, or Spain, because um, the truthfulness uh, must be um, substantiate, substantiated by facts in a very rigorous way. And we know this from the other cases, from food industry and chemical industry in the past. But I uh, still wanted to, to show a little bit about, um, because what's the real news in Croatia? I mean, the real news is not uh, on the advertising scene. It's the automotive scene that generates the, the, the news here. And um, uh, there is, um, uh, you know, people have like a question mark when they uh, hear Croatia and automot automotive in the same sentence. Unlike Slovakia, for instance, which had... Um, quite a lengthy history of car industry investments and uh, local production, Croatia did not. Yet, um, uh, this year, uh, we had suddenly a, a car company, a Unicorn, evaluated at $1 billion uh, after only uh, slightly more than um, uh, 12 years uh, in, in existence. Uh, so, I wanted to point out that automotive industry in itself is really active and we have not only the startup models such as Rimac Automobili or their affiliated company Grape uh, that is that is um, uh, developing electric bikes which are most powerful ele electric bikes in the world. Uh, we also have Infinum which just received the Porsche um, uh, investment to develop autonomous driving on a very high level. So these are our uh, garage model uh, auto industry, but we have also the traditional ones such as Lipic Glass, which produces glass uh, for Ferrari, Aston Martin, uh, for uh, many top end cars. Uh, they are totally low profile. So they are ever, I, I wonder if they will ever go into any advertising trouble really. Uh, with, with their product, because if you wouldn't be following what's going on in the automotive industry, you wouldn't know that they even exist, yet they exist for, for decades. They are actually a privatized uh, company from the, uh, from the Yugoslav time. The uh, same is with other plastic, and we can uh, go to the other slides just to show a little bit about these two companies. Uh, here you see that um, uh, Rimac uh, Automobiles, the unicorn, which I mentioned and whose Nevera model I, I, I showed there, was uh, founded in 2009. In 2012, uh, they retooled this BMW, which became the fastest accelerating electric vehicle in the world. Now, Rimac is again the fastest accelerating vehicle period in the world. Um, in 2013, they came up with the concept one car, and I will show you something related to advertising just very soon. But um, uh, it, now, uh, this year, they launched um, Nevera, which is a production model of the um, concept two, uh, uh, which was uh, which was uh, which was introduced in 2018. Over the next uh, three years, they will produce 150 models at 2 million, 2.1 million euro each. Uh, and um, they are selling briskly. They already sold the first year's production and they were offered. Uh, this is also hot off the press. Uh, they, they were offered and introduced a week ago. So regarding environmental issues, um, I mean, Mate Rimac, the, the founder, is, 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 is a vegetarian or vegan. Uh, so he, he, he speaks about his own convictions, you know, and projects them on the company. Um, the, the company Campus, which is here, uh, this is a render, they, they just started building it. Um, is, and we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, this is this is this is um, this is going to be a totally green environment, you know. Uh, so, is there anything to assess in terms of advertising? Not really, in my opinion. It is more of a PR, a general values, 
uh, with no claims attached. Uh, so, so, so we will see how will this develop. Just wanted to show uh, that this company had the crisis management case study. It is quite interesting. Uh, one of their two million cars that was the C2 um, driven by Richard Hammond, a British journalist, um, uh, went off the road uh, on on a hill climb in Switzerland, and then they introduced in advertising uh, the picture of the fire extinguisher with the words. Um, uh, 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 in the case of hill climb extinguish fire, um, which was kind of a humorous way um, to, to, to sell it. That model C2 was not for sale, yet they sold after this and, and how they managed the crisis. In a week, they sold three of, so they made three more just for sale. Okay, let's, let's go, let's go further. AD plastic. Obviously, we have plastics here. So how do you how do you manage, you know, as a plastic industry to look green without greenwashing? And this company, that's a big company. They have um, they are multinational essentially. They have um, uh, production sites in five different countries and pr produce for you know half of the European auto industry. Uh, go to the next slide, and they. For instance, a project their um, a company through um, different awards, which is then obviously objective. People are not checking really uh, whether a Deloitte Green Frog Award is um, uh, credible or not. But this company really then communicates uh, that they uh, uh, make uh, classical um, uh, fuel cars lighter, therefore making them uh, uh, consume less, and that they actually um, use recycled materials and that they, their products are recyclable and so on. So it is again more of a PR than uh, real advertising, which they are using, yet um, uh, in, in light also of stringency of uh, European uh, of Croatian regulations, um, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't be uh, easy uh, with, with, with your claims. So, so it is strict, it is likely to be uh, applied stringently to, to the offenders, but the local companies are doing this kind of a soft uh, claims around which are not, uh, which have not been yet subject to verification. Thank you. Thank you, Mladen. And Lara, we'll take us through Africa and the Middle East. Okay, so I'll, I'll run through quickly. Um, what I, I really gathered uh, with regards to environmental considerations was that um, the one thing, at least in Africa, across even our colleagues, um, on the Gala network, the one feedback that I got back um, uniformly, uniform in, in uniform, um, was that we have a huge um, influx of um, secondhand cars. So clearly cars that are done and done with um, somewhere else in the world end up pretty much, I think, um, on this part, or, you know, on the, on the continent. That doesn't mean that, you know, they should there are no regulations, um, so to say. I think it's really a case of enforcement and um, uh, more monitoring, if, if, you, if you ask me. For instance, for Nigeria, we do have regulations and guidelines um, that have been passed to control pollution, hazardous wastes, and effluents. You know, in Nigeria, we've signed on to pretty much every convention, international treaty and convention um, that's relevant to the environment. Um, the legislations do exist, you know, to tackle real life situations. So we have laws that, um, or regulations that ban, you know, huge trucks that are emitting toxic fumes, which you will find in, in most cities or outback cities um, on the continent. So there are rules that, that govern that. Um, I'm sure nobody, no manufacturer wakes up and thinks, you know, I'm going to put that up as an advert. But if that comes up, I don't think we should think that um, Africa is um, a, a continent where we can dump, you know, what doesn't work anymore and not get um, into uh, a bit of a fix. So the guidelines and standards for um, environmental pollution control, you know, we, we, um, there are effluent limitations. 
um, the compulsory installations of anti-pollution equipment, we actually have one major um, car manufacturer here in Nigeria. He's called, um, is the, the brand is IVM and the group is um, Innocent Group and they're 100% owned, privately owned um, company. And one of their claims, which I, I saw on their website actually, was, um, you know, they say they, their product line includes heavy duty vehicles, middle and high level buses, special environment friendly vehicles. I think that's something that, you know, we should, we should get the um, ombudsman um, to have a look at to actually see if that claim is right. But, you know, I think ultimately, um, as we emerge as a continent and, you know, um, as, as our economy um, gets more sophisticated, even much more sophisticated than it is, I think the environmental considerations will be something to watch for and to look at um, as we do our advertisements. Thank you, Jared. That's great. Thank you very much. Really interesting to see um, the developing situation in all of these different countries and how environmental is obviously a hot topic um, across the board. Um, and that there are so many similarities. I wanted to give an opportunity to just flag any other sort of significant hot topics that are in particular markets. And while we're doing this, given that we've got sort of the last 10 minutes left, I think for France in particular, if we can wrap in some of the questions that have come through on some of the sort of main issues, I think you already are intending on covering a lot of that ground. But if there is any sort of question we can incorporate, that would be fantastic. And anybody else who wants to ask any questions, feel free um, and we can incorporate that as we go. The only thing I wanted to mention in the UK in terms of um, interesting hot topics is that of comparative claims. And it comes back to this point of, are you comparing, in the old world, it used to be quite easy. You'd compare a petrol or diesel car to a petrol or diesel car. Now, are you comparing the right kind of hybrid to the right kind of hybrid? And there are all sorts of different nuances now that need to be thought about especially if you're naming competitors, identifying competitors, obviously. And if you're making these broad green claims, as we've seen, there's a focus, a regulatory focus on those. Um, should we ask Wistran just to sort of, uh, from Sweden, just to have a look at um, a couple of interesting examples there, and then we'll come on to France when we can. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, well, in, in uh, besides environmental claims, uh, when it comes to automotive, uh, advertising we have you have to also consider the uh, the principle of unlawfulness uh, which is a well is well established uh, under Swedish marketing law uh, and the principle establishes that uh, marketing act activities must be lawful meaning that uh, such activities must not violate uh, another law uh, as it will not be considered consistent with good marketing practices to expose consumers to unlawful activities uh, or mislead them to conduct unlawful activities, activities themselves. And uh, of particular interest here is that Sweden has an overall ban on uh, off-road uh, driving on bare snow-free ground. Uh, and this sometimes causes a challenge for car manufacturers that, who wants to showcase their cars in, in more extreme environments or or illustrate off-road capacity or or similar uh, and, and one car manufacturer experienced that quite recently when a number of ads were challenged and considered not to be consistent with good marketing practices because they were considered to give the impression of cars being driven in in off-road terrain uh, and you can see uh, some examples of the banned ads on the slide uh, and one where a car seems to be driven in, in, uh, in terrain and some water or river or similar, or a one in the desert, uh, uh, even if we don't have deserts in, in, in Sweden, uh, uh, that uh, would, if, if there were, they would be forbidden to drive there, uh, and also cloud or dust. Uh, but still, in, in one case here, uh, just to show the, the comparison between what is lawful and not, uh, there is one ad where uh, which where the car is shown in the terrain, uh, but on a road. Uh, and that's the reason why it was cleared. So this uh, essentially shows that in Sweden, you must not only consider which claims or, or the statement that you use in advertising, but also which photos and, and images that you, uh, that you put to use in the ad. Thank you, Eric. That's really interesting. Um, and common to France as well, I suspect. Caroline can tell us a bit more. Yes, just to, to be short, we have the same rule in France uh, because motor vehicles uh, must not be shown off-road. 
and then must not be shown parked on a natural space either, so on sand or on grass. And uh, they must not um, be, show, um, be shown um, in a violation of road co code. And I wanted to share with you the, this recent decision um, from the French SLO's jury. Um, this ad has been um, deemed not compliant with the SLO's codes, in particular automotive, automotive codes, which sets for that uh, you must not show a um, car uh, which violates road code. And this um, ad has been shot in Marseille in an, uh, on an area dedicated to pedestrians. And the jury took into account the fact that the ad is broadcast over the internet and can be uh, viewed by people who may recognize that this is a famous location in Marseille dedicated to pedestrians. So the uh, French SRO rejected the argument of the advertiser, which consisted in saying that there are pedestrians on the left side of, of the image working on the pavement, which is clearly separated from the paved road so that it appears to be um, a road open to the traffic. But this argument has been rejected because people may know that it is a road uh, open to pedestrians only. And the fact that the advertiser, and advertiser has been granted the right to shoot here from the uh, town hall has been deemed um, irrelevant too. So I found that this decision is very strict. So be careful if you uh, shoot an ad in a famous location, if there, is, if there is a risk that people know that it is not a road open to the traffic, your ad uh, could be deemed uh, not compliant. <laughs> Sure, and that goes for parking spaces as well, doesn't it? I think that's an issue that comes up a lot. You need to be parked yeah. somewhere that's officially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, you you must uh, add a, a parking sign or be the situation look like a parking. Otherwise, uh, you add uh, maybe deemed uh, violating uh, SLO codes too. So be be careful. <laughs> So difficult in Sweden and France to show off-road cars, off-roading and sporty cars being sporty across Europe as well, I have to say. So yeah. is that is that true of other markets? So let's be creative. <laughs> exactly. We need to be creative to get around these issues. Absolutely. Ignacio. Yes, thank you. Finally, I wanted to bring a couple of examples of uh, the hot topics that the car manufacturers are facing in Spain at this moment. Most of the uh, disputes are uh, focusing on pricing information uh, because it is usual, uh, and I think that all of us were used to see uh, always a, a very competitive price that we know we have to read the small letters and uh, the additional information. But uh, the consumer authorities are being very strict and day by day more. And we, for example, we lost this case of Astra representing um, Opel in Spain. And it's a public case, so I can mention it because some colleagues have already called me to because other um, clients of law firms are uh, facing similar problems. And it's uh, because Sometimes the price appearing uh, is the price that you pay when you get an official finance. So when you get a loan, if you don't get a loan at the time of uh, purchasing the car, you don't get that price ever. Obviously, then the price is much higher because then you have to add the interest that you paid. Uh, but this is a different product, not the, uh, the car price. So we have been defending that they are two different products and that the information is still truth although it might not be complete until you go into the small letter. But despite of that, some sanctions are coming. And the latest one is for Renault, which is the, my final slide. Uh, this is not an official sanction. It was just a, a jury opinion from out of control, where they said that Renault for 199 per month is not a truthful and complete information because you have to pay also an entrance fee and also the interest in addition to that. So uh, everyone should watch always now in Spain the pricing information when going into, into the market. Thank you very much. Thank you, very, very interesting. And can I ask, um, we've got another two minutes or so to go. So let's let's whip through these final sort of points if we can. Uh, Maladin. 
Oh, Laura? Sorry, I, I, I have set uh, the unmute to automatic, but it doesn't. No problem. So, sorry about that. So, um, uh, you know, I will, I will address something that comes into the, the legality of what you make, not of the content, because so many of the car adverts are now shot in Croatia that I just wanted to draw attention to the local requirements for shooting. And uh, there is a law on audiovisual activities. There is obviously location permits that, that are necessary. There will be regulations on visas for non-EU um, team members. Uh, then there is the, the shooting with uh, unmanned aircraft systems. That's the drones, you know, which uh, half of the adverts today, car adverts would contain the drone footage that you need uh, to uh, to apply for in Croatia. And I'm not going into details. Let's move further. Uh, so, so as I said, you see, the, the, there is all this usual. Um, stuff with filming on foreign locations. Croatia has a great experience with that, even from Yugoslav times. I don't know if you know that Sofia's Choice, Tin Drum, uh, Winds of War, they were all shot on location in Croatia or in Yugoslavia then. And then um, now there's obviously this, this production company still draw on this. So it's very easy to, 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 to do this. And let's just see uh, in the last seconds of our today's webinar, the few slides um, from the real locations. Um, and you see, I think this is the Peugeot, that's the recent electrical uh, Peugeot uh, shot uh, on, on a bridge um, uh, to the mainland from the island park. Let's move further. And uh, that's a Porsche uh, on, on the island park. And there's another German manufacturer on the island park, don't think that we have only one road in Croatia. This one just for some reason is obviously good for marketing, but we have a lot of locations and there are others uh, not to speak of Dubrovnik and so on. So, so there, there, there is, there is a lot of, lot of um, opportunity to shoot. Thank you. Very interesting. And yes, so clearly a sophisticated country when it comes to shooting car ads, because you've, you've been there and done that and, and covered a lot of ground. I just want to check yeah. with Lara if you have any other points that you wanted to to raise um, from Africa. No, and the Middle no, East. I don't. No, I'm good. Thank you. Perfect. That perfect. Works. No problem at all. Well, we're bang on time, and we haven't had any extra questions, so I'm I'm tempted to draw it to a close there. I think it's been really, really helpful. I hope you found it helpful. We've covered a lot of ground in terms of environmental issues and flagging a few additional points, which I think will be of use to lots of you. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we will make the slides available and the recording afterwards. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.